What's up, everybody? I am so excited to have you join us today for our weekly webinar. And I am really excited about today's guest, Dr. David Cruz. Y'all, he is the founder and CEO of Web Exercises. I have talked about their product before on the webinar. Dr. Jay Greenstein has also talked about this incredible product that they offer before. Um, in fact, if you follow Dr. Jay Greenstein on social media, um, this is even, he even talks about it in some of his videos. So, um, Dr. Cruz has been a sports chiropractor for over 20 years, treating um, athletic injuries from weekend warriors to professional athletes. Um, he received his Bachelor's of Science degree in athletic training and completed graduate coursework in kinesiology. So the combination of this background in sports medicine and an interest in technology made him passionate about bringing these two worlds together, resulting in this incredible product we like to call Web Exercises. So we are super stoked to have you here today, Dr. Cruz, um, and I'm just You've been on my dream list of people to have on the <laughs> webinar. And in truth, y'all, we've been talking about doing this for, it's been a, over a year that we've talked about doing this through a bunch of mutual friends. So I'm so glad that it finally came to fruition at this time. And so, Dr. Cruz, take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Christy. And just to your whole team, I know like Dr. J and so many other people in the circle. And I'm so uh, glad to, to be here and just share some, you know, what, what I consider of uh, kind of my, my life's work, if you will. Um, as, as Chris was mentioning, I practiced for many years. Um, so I know exactly the pain points and that's where I want to come from today. I want to talk about active care. I mean, who's doing it? Who's not doing it? I know there's some chiropractors that are big sports guys. They're like, yep, do it. Other people are like, you know, I should be doing it, but I don't know how to get started. So what I want to do is go over essentially, you know, a lot of the whys, because if we understand the whys behind we, why we do things, um, why are you a chiropractor? You can name a hundred reasons probably, right? Well, I'm going to talk about why we should be doing some exercise as part of active care. So whether you're a sports guy or whether you're just a focus on general health um, and not a lot of sports, exercise is something that you should really consider. So let's go ahead and, and get started here. So today what we're going to talk about is, you know, why injuries occur, why do they reoccur? If we have a better understanding of that, then again, we'll have a better way to go about the approach of getting those patients some exercise or stretches. And then what are some simple keys to success? What are some things to think about as you're talking with patients in being effective in the office, out of the office, and following up with them? You know, what are some strategies to hopefully make them successful in the office as well as out of the office? And so let's go ahead and get started. And so one thing I want to show is there's, some of these slides, there's an overlay, and I apologize. We had a little bit of a, a slide issue, um, so I really apologize. I can get you a, the clean slide deck, um, and what you'll see is a couple overlays. So again, I apologize. So like, my question was going to be to everybody, you know, what percentage of chiropractors do you think prescribe exercise? And you can kind of see the answer here, so it, it, it's not, it's not um, too much of a mystery. But this is a study that was done um, in 2014 where they looked at, for back pain patients, who prescribes exercise the most? PTs, chiros, or MDs? PTs prescribe exercise, as you would imagine, about 64% of the time. Chiropractors, really only about a third of the percent of the time, 33% of the time. And... What's your why, if you will? So my why is trying to get chiropractors to prescribe more exercise as a component to the chiropractic adjustment, because what we'll see is that that's the way we're going to get the best outcomes. So a lot of my whys of what I do, as Christy was saying, every, every day is to hopefully make it easier, more efficient, more effective for practicing uh, chiropractors, because I was exactly where uh, everybody was in practice, trying to figure out patient flow, I should give them some stretches, give them some exercises, how do I do that, you know, all these different questions that come up. So hopefully we'll help uh, alleviate some of those, those questions today. And so when we start talking about injuries, somebody comes in your office, let's just 
take the, uh, the, the classic low back patient. Low back patient comes in, they're intelligent, they're leaning over. You know, why, why do these injuries occur? Think to yourself, right? There's probably a multitude of, of reasons, you know, could it be a car accident? Could it be a lifting injury? Could it be poor posture? There's, there's a variety of different. But if we're talking about the number one cause of injury and number two cause, the number one cause is a previous injury. So the number one cause of any injury is a previous injury followed by asymmetrical movement patterns. And so think about this. You have a patient that comes in. How many times do patients come in for re-injury or recurrence of back pain? A lot. I know I used to see it a lot. Or recurrence of neck pain. Well, there's an actual reason why that occurs. And we're going to go through some of that actually in a little bit. But the number one cause of injury is a previous injury. Number two is asymmetrical movement patterns, which means we move differently. After an injury, our body starts to get rewired in the sense of becoming intelligent and moving differently. And it actually shuts down muscles we're going to see and changes the way muscles work and fire. And so, after the first two, then all those other reasons, posture, sedentary work habits, um, you know, bending, uh, inadequate rehabilitation, all these different things can, can lead to, to injury. But to keep in mind, the, num the, current, the theme of this is going to be why do injuries occur and think about previous injury when you're taking that history. I mean, how often, you know, you're, you're taking a history and they, your, your patient says, well, you know, I haven't had a slip or fall or anything, but then you dig in deeper and lo and behold, they had a car accident 10 years ago and you see a bunch of degeneration and, and, and other uh, findings on, on x-ray or with your, your physical exam. And so just always kind of keep that in mind, the previous injury and then asymmetrical movement patterns, meaning we just move, move differently. And so as we move forward, this study I, I threw up and a lot of this, again, all these slides are really kind of evidence-based because we want a solid foundation of why we do things. And this is a study when I was in chiropractic school back in 2000, uh, 2000 in 94, a study that showed it's more for just than just back pain, right? Because years ago it was just back pain. And this is one of the earlier studies that showed, hey, you know what? Poor posture and position affects everything. It, spinal pain, okay, we know that, but how about mood, blood pressure, headache, all these things, lung capacity. So that person sitting at the computer, right? Two, three years ago, probably we didn't see as much of that. But what happened in the, in the past two years, right? The world changed, COVID. Everybody's working from home. Everybody is, you know, sitting at on their couch, everybody's at the dining room table and, and so forth, right? So this has become a much, much bigger, much more prevalent problem is that these positions, not only is it related to pain, but lung capacity is a huge factor. So going back to what I was first talking about, okay, I'm a sports chiropractor, I give injury, I give exercises for um, some rehabilitation for this patient that has a, has a rotator cuff issue or sprained ankle. But, you know, how many of us treat patients uh, that breed, right? Pretty much uh, all of us, I hope. So there is absolutely a fit for some stretches and exercise, whether you're doing sports, whether you're doing general health, because all of our patients breathe, all of our patients have blood pressure, all of our patients have, you know, pulse and that affects their mood. So kind of keep that in mind as we go forward in that we're going to try and think, make things real simple for you in getting started on some exercise programming. And so we find that smartphones really, how smart are they? Well, they can absolutely affect the, uh, the, the breathing. What this one study showed was that this was um, looking at patients that had prolonged uh, basically smartphone use. I think it was over two hours a day. And what they showed was that the neck pain associated with that 83% of the time had a respiratory component to it. So 
lower um, uh, um, inspiration, expiration. So I have kind of a, an a example. Everybody, what I want you to do is go ahead, pretend you are one of those people on a smartphone. I want you to just kind of look down like you're, you're on your smartphone, right? Head down, okay? You're kind of crouched over, just like your patients would be. Take the big breath in, right? Try and take as big a breath in as you can, okay? Now what I want you to do is sit upright, pretend you have the phone in front of you, eye level, now take a breath in, right? Much easy, inspiration, expiration, much easier. So we can immediately see, right, with those, those effects of, you know, rounding, I'm on a phone versus upright. So we know without, without question that posture, forward head carriage, absolutely not only relates to, to pain, but you're absolutely going to see respiratory function affected with that as, as well. And so here's a follow-up study, and we, there's a lot of things here, and I'm trying to focus on some, some high level. What is, you know, what do 90% of your patients have, right? 90% of your patients probably have this forward head carriage, right? So that's why I'm just kind of hitting some highlights here, because this is literally what I'm going over today is kind of the cliff notes that, that what you need to know out of a six-hour lecture I do. And so with the forward head posture, this was um, a systematic review. They looked at 18 different studies on neck pain and respiratory function. And what their conclusion was, was that, yeah, forward head posture, abnormal abnormalities definitely affect, you know, breathing movement and respiratory function. There's no question about that. They also found that, right, it negatively affects proprioception and stability. Interesting, huh? So think about this. So we have some, you ever have elderly patients? What is the, one of the biggest fears with an elderly patient, a fall, right? From a healing perspective, it, it, it can be actually life-threatening. I mean, if, if an elderly patient has a fractured hip, that is significant because the likelihood of, depending on their age and function, coming back from that um, can, can be life, life-threatening and, and limiting. So if we talk about affecting somebody's life, you know, getting their shoulders back, improving their head posture for an elderly population could be significant. So muscle changes as well. How many times do we assess somebody that has forward head carriage and those muscles, the traps and shoulders are just so tonic and so tight, right? So we can have a really profound effect adding exercise and some stretches on top of the chiropractic adjustment. So let's move on. So when we talk about the injury, okay? An injury is all these different red components around the structure and posture. So you may have some muscular imbalances, right? We talked about some uh, impaired movement, right? What's the number two cause of injury? Asymmetrical movement patterns, which is that faulty motor learning, right? We move differently after an injury. We also have, that's gonna load joints differently, right? If we're intelligent, if we're leaning, if muscles are firing differently on right to left side, that's going to be a factor. You're going to have some altered joint loading, right? That can exacerbate any sort of joint degeneration, creates an inflammatory process, creates tight muscles, and we're kind of go round and round and round. So really all these aspects need to be addressed as part of this injury cycle that occurs. And the exercise can be can be put in at any at any time as part of the injury cycle. If you have a patient that comes in for a hot low back, you're not going to get them a bunch, give them a bunch of injuries, but what can you have them do? Get up and walk every, you know, 10, 15 minutes to change your position, right? So there's definitely a, a, a time and a place to do exercise, but it can really be as simple as getting up and moving and walking to something a little bit more, more specific. Kind of keep that, keep that in mind. There's always the right time for that. And we know that when we get people to exercise, back to patients, you know, do I treat sports? Do I treat general health, wellness? Well, this is an interesting study out of the uh, British Journal of Pharmacology. And they compared a bunch of different treatments and exercise was one of them. And one of their findings was exactly this. Exercise is so beneficial for somebody's health that it should be considered a drug. It literally said that. And it can be considered a treatment for established diseases. They listed 40 common diseases that exercises exercise was effective in helping to treat and prevent. So, you know, let's talk about 
how effective you know chiropractic is you know across all the different types of ailments right that's why exercise and uh, uh chiropractic i think goes so well together and there's actually a, a little bit of a historical perspective that image that i showed early on this one because this is kind of let me let me scroll back if i can a couple slides so this slide when we got started ah uh, sorry one more i thought it was going to be quicker right here that's bj palmer's clinic in 1934. so bj took on and the early chiropractors took on the teachings of exercise from a guy by the name of bernard mcfadden who lived in the mid 1800s to the early 1900s and he had a, had a sanitarium for health wellness uh he published a, a journal on health and wellness uh, he called the medical professional uh pill pill pushers and he really uh, promoted health and wellness uh, lifestyle, and it was called physical culture. And so BJ and a lot of the early chiropractors adopted those teachings. And that's why, you know, what my why is, well, it's not just because of me, because I know back in the early 1900s, chiropractors were integrating this as part of their care plan, because chiropractic and exercise have been together since the beginning of chiropractic. And that's that's a true historical um, perspective right there. So, you know, and, and back to our study here, exercise is, you know, so important in, in helping patients beyond just on the rehabilitation phase. And this was an interesting study. So what this was, was that what we've been dealing with COVID, right? And I'm sure a lot of patients have really uh, uh, been affected from a psychological uh, perspective and trying to promote health. Get this. So this was done from uh, Kaiser. Kaiser went retroactively and looked at 48,000 patient cases in the year 2020. And what they found is that there is a significant, it's linear in the sense of the more active you are, the more physically fit you are, the less risk of severe symptoms of COVID. So it's clear within the medical that exercise is important they don't do that we do i think what only we can do is providing chiropractic adjustment and exercise as well as any other treatment that is going to help support the health of of the body so it's really clear you know that what your why should be is you know what we know exercise is essential for some rehabilitation purposes but you know it's it's essential now for your general health. Back to how many patients how many patients do you treat that breathe, right? Uh, I think everybody. So really kind of start thinking about those patients that are coming in just a forward head carriage or as you get patients onto more of a wellness plan, right? If they're coming in once a oh, you know, month or twice a month for wellness, well, they should have some stretches to keep doing to support what they're doing when they come in in the office. So you want them staying active on a stretch on an exercise based on what what they're doing at home or or at work so what we're going to talk about is more of the active care because you guys do a great job at this right pain control making people feel better what we want to talk about a little more is you know how do we start to integrate exercise and and kind of what's the why behind it why why uh do is there or excuse me why do those injuries keep occurring and let's let's talk about that and so we know that spinal manipulation that's an exercise is superior to just the chiropractic adjustment or exercise and we know this has been a number of studies but this one uh, from um, about 20 years ago what they did that three groups chiropractic adjustment only exercise only and then chiropractic plus exercise and so what they found was that the the chiropractic adjustment and exercise was superior to just the adjustment alone or the exercise alone as it relates to pain patient satisfaction and just overall improvement so we definitely know and there's there's a lot of studies whether it's the the neck or the low back that support this combination of of care so when we we talk about the exercise and doing the adjustments. I mean, think about for the ones that do do some exercise, do we adjust first? Do we have them stretch first? I would say always get this question, you know, 
depends on your patient flow. Everybody's going to treat a little bit differently, have that flow a little differently. But if we look from a scientific perspective, we want to essentially exercise after the uh, adjustment because the manual mobilization, they call it, or adjustment can actually help break different postural faults, break pain patterns. And they basically say that it, it can abort those pain patterns for about 30 to 45 minutes. So you can adjust somebody and then they can move a little bit better. And that allows you to start grooving those proper movement patterns. So if possible, adjust before you have them do a stretch exercise because they'll just feel that much better. That, With that in mind, you don't want to exercise somebody if they're they're still in pain because all they're going to be doing is compensating. I want to make sure, make make that clear. Exercise, as we see, it's it's a combination of some art and some science, um, and a lot of it is going to come down to your clinic, clinical experience because there's nothing that's going to replace replace your own clinical um, judgment. And so, when we talk about exercise selection, um, there's always kind of a risk reward. I know this specifically for the low back. Cause we're also going to talk about neck. If you look at this image, it's really the the person standing that they're measuring uh, intradiscal pressure, and the movements that you see up top and then below that gives you the actual increase or decrease in intradiscal pressure. So you might think of an exercise that really engages or see an exercise on YouTube or or some somewhere that go oh, God, that's a great low back exercise to see somebody doing. But there's always a risk reward where we want to be aware of how much we're activating the muscle and then how much we're loading the joint. If somebody's coming in for some facet issues, we don't just want to start do, giving them a bunch of extension exercises, right? Because we don't want to start jamming those up. So just kind of keep that in mind. I put that on there. Just, you know, there's always a risk reward to, to exercise. And I'm going to actually turn off my notifications for email sorry about that so as as we move on think of the neck and i was going to uh, have this as as a guess i wasn't going to have this um show up quite yet but the stability of the cervical spine is 80 percent muscular think about that so the ligamentous structures are going to basically hold the bone to bone as as we know but the stability of the cervical spine is 80% muscular. And with accidents, with injuries, yes, we need to address that because we're going to see that muscles start reacting differently after injury. And so really think about your cervical spine and look at that image from the mid traps going all the way up to the suboccipital area. We need to address this both anterior and posteriorly when we are seeing a patient for neck pain. So let's go ahead and keep moving forward here. And so Treating, for instance, car accidents, right? Why do injuries occur? Okay, what's the number one cause? Like previous injury. Second was asymmetrical movement patterns. So let's look at this in the sense that those arrows are pointing to muscles that are showing some atrophy. So what this one study showed, and there's many of them, that when you don't use it, you lose it. That's, that's actually really the case. So what they showed in this study was that there's actually fatty infiltration, which means you don't use the muscle, the muscle starts to atrophy, and that actually starts to get replaced over time with fat. And so this shows that you basically have atrophied muscle, fat infiltration, and then that muscle isn't working as well. So other muscles that are synergistic that help assist start taking over. And that's what they refer to as load sharing. So they talk about a reorganization of how muscles work in, in this study. And we see this over and over again from the, from the anterior to the posterior to the neck to the low back. It's really consistent in that an injury causes a muscle to shut down, shut off to some degree because it's in, a, it's in an injured state. But once the pain starts to resolve, that muscle function doesn't come back. And we're going to see that in the low back as well. And so that's what's one of the take home points is. I'll say that again, is that injury to the muscle, whiplash, for instance, that muscle shuts down. When the pain starts to resolve, that muscle 
does not start working again as it did previously because there was this reorganization of a motor strategy and this load sharing. So these other muscles take over. So really keep that, that in mind with every neck pain patient, we can see this consistently over and over and over again. The literature is clear with this. We see this also on the anterior. So what I want you to do is everybody sit up nice and tall. I want you to just gently nod your head yes, just a little movement. Now what I want you to do is take your head chin to chest, okay? Two different types of movement right there. The little chin nod is the longest capitis, longest coli. The full flexion is your anterior scalene and your SCM. Now here's the significance, talking about load sharing. We talked about the muscles in the posterior in the previous slide. This is what happens on the anterior. This is one of the most overlooked um, uh, uh, components to, to chronic neck pain is that your longus capitis and your longus coli are responsible for about 17% of flexion. So they help in flexion. Eight, uh, 83% or so is anterior scalene and your SCM for that flexion component. They're extremely critical as a deep spine stabilizer. So is it, what's a deep spine stabilizer? So the deep spine stabilizer are like the multifidized, these intersegmentals, the ones that go spinous to spinous or two, uh, two segments. It's, that's the same thing with the longus capitis, longus coli. They are stabilizer. The significance is of those stabilizers is once those stop functioning, it increases the instability. The function of the stabilizing muscles, and I'll say this again, provides stability in a feed forward mechanism. Now, what does that mean? It means that if I'm going to nod my head down to look at something, a millisecond, that's actually measurable, it's a few milliseconds before I actually move, my brain says two things. Deep spine stabilizers, whether it's the splenius capitis on the posterior or whether it's the longus capitis and longus coli in the neck or whether it's multifidized in the low back, it says stabilize the spine, then the bigger global movers move it. The problem is that when there's an injury, those muscles, they show a delay in firing, which means I start to move before those stabilizing ones, those so important ones actually stabilize, leading to more load, more shear stress, recurrent overtime injury, okay? What's the number one cause of injury? Previous injury, right? Because of asymmetrical movement patterns, asymmetrical stability. So what this study showed was essentially exactly that. So patients with a neck pain, you know, history of neck pain have a, demonstrated a delay in the deep neck flexor activation. And they go on to say a significant deficit in the deep neck reflex automation feed forward uh, control of the cervical spine. So it helps control the spine, right? We need this to actually start working again. What helps it start working? Well, there's no evidence in the cervical spine that the chiropractic adjustment does it. The only thing from a literature perspective that shows that is a couple exercises and one I'm going to show you, right? Because I said I was going to basically take a six-hour lecture and give it to you in about 45 minutes uh, today. And so the exercise I'll go over in a moment, but they showed that by doing this one exercise, yes, we can reestablish that, which is going to be critically important. And so let's talk about that, okay? So forward head posture, right? A lot of you are familiar with this. It's just a head retraction where you pull the head back, eyes level doing a little scapular squeeze also helps increase that and you get a better outcome. So that's, you know, one of the top, we're looking at probably three exercises. What's the take home forward head posture is going to be absolutely one, one to do forward head carriage, deep neck flexor. This one, I'm going to need to talk you through my apologies because we had a PowerPoint. Uh, my PowerPoint couldn't sync. Um, and so it's just a static issue. I can have uh, Christy send out a video link to this because it's really important. It's literally lying on your back and really kind of doing what I had everybody do um, a, a moment ago with just kind of a little chin nod. You're literally doing a chin nod and lifting up the head about an inch off the floor, off the treatment table. And you can actually measure how long patients hold it. There's normative values. 
And keep in mind, those are healthy subjects, the 30 second and 40 second pain free. So if you try this with your patients, it's literally lying them down on their back and they are doing a little chin nod and rolling their head up off only about two inches off the table and holding it. They should be able to hold it for 30 to 40 seconds. And if not, you're going to start to see that pain. You don't want to test them on this. You're going to see some chin jutting. You might see some shaking a little bit. All of those are signs that there's other muscles taking over. And so the deep cervical flexor neck exercise is one of the key things to really help with chronic neck pain. The other one is posture shoulders back. This, uh, again, I apologize, we'll get you the video. This is lying on your back. She basically put her arms up at her side so you can kind of see me a little bit, right? And she's just kind of lying, really just sliding the arms up and down. And you can have patients do this if they get up and stand up against the wall. If they're on the floor, they can lie down. So what it does, it helps flatten that thoracic spine a little bit, gets their head back, and gets those scapular muscles working again. It's a really good stretch exercise to do, super easy for patients to do. Um, and you can pretty much have patients at any state do this because it's more of a range of motion instead of a strength and exercise. And that's what we want to restore, is we want to really get people moving, restore some mobility first, and then work on some strengthening after that. So let's keep rolling here. I know I'm getting a little short of time, so we're going to keep rolling right ahead. So this is the, the low back ex, uh, research study that I was talking about. Just like the cervical spine, we have the multifidi in the cervical all the way down to the, um, the low back. And the low back, what they did with this study is for recurrent back pain patients. They, had, they put a needle EMG in a deep spine multifidi, and they simply had patients stand on a force plate, and they measured arm movement. And what they all literally did was had patients move their arm forward and back, and they measured the feed-forward mechanism. And so as we go ahead and do any movement, whether it's lifting your arm, whether it is you know, bending forward, there's a feed forward mechanism that deep spine stabilizers tighten to stabilize the spine. And then we, we move. Everybody try this. Okay. Stand up. I want you to reach behind with one hand and your thumb kind of palpate real deep in the spine, maybe even arch back a little bit. So the muscles aren't taut. And then just kind of, once you kind of, you're right next to the spinous, right on kind of your, your rector, kind of where your multifidi would be, then kind of lean forward till the muscles kind of turn on a, a little bit, okay? What I want you to do is lift your arm, your opposite arm. You can move your arm around. You should be feeling that muscle fire, right? So I'm not moving my back at all, but you just moving your arm, your low back is stabilizing because what's your arm? It's a counterweight. It's providing a load on your spine. So your 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 uh, deep spine stabilizers and erecti muscles have to tighten. Back pain patients have a delay in that. So you're already moving before your the brain goes, oh, we should be stabilizing. And so that's what they demonstrated in in this. And they what they showed was that, you know, the recurrent uh, unilateral low back pain patients do not control their back muscles in the same way their healthy counterparts, right? So the injured people, the people with chronic low back pain don't control their back the same way. And these leave people vulnerable to re-injury, right? And hence predisposed to recurrent episodes. What did I say in the beginning was a number one cause of injury, right? Previous injury, then asymmetrical movement patterns. This is exactly why, whether it's a cervical spine, whether it's a low back, that is the why. So chiropractic adjustment has been shown to help increase hypertrophy, the, the deep spine muscles in a couple studies out of, out of Australia, um, up to two weeks. What they didn't show was the feed forward mechanism. So we know that doing some exercise in the cervical spine, that deep cervical spine, uh, exercise when they're on your back and lifting the head just a little bit and flexing, that's been shown to help those deep spine uh, cervical muscles reactivate. Well, what are we going to do to help the low back? Let's talk about that. And this was another slide uh, on risk versus reward. So I just uh, wanted to uh, also add that in there to what we talked about previously. 
the best exercise to strengthen the muscle might not be the best choice because you might aggravate somebody, say that has a, a still a, a disc that's a little flared. We might not want to give them a, a crunch, okay? So let's take a look at some exercises. If there's four go-to exercises, those are them. Your cat camel to increase some mobility. Bird dog, which is right on all fours. You're reaching out with one hand, the opposite leg extends, and there's a little dowel across this model's back that if the dowel falls, she's out of position. So it's really just a, a training tool you can use with your patient. Side plank, and then a McGill curl up. McGill curl up is similar to a crunch. You just put your hands in the low back and lift your chest shoulders about six inches off the floor. So it's like a modified crunch, and your low back is a little bit more. Uh, stable. These are McGill's big three also, which is the bird dog, side plank, and curl up. Most of you are familiar with McGill, probably the number one researcher um, in the world on the low back. Um, so big four right there. They can be done in office. They can be done at home. No equipment needed. Those can absolutely make a huge difference overall with regards to back pain patients. And we know this because we were involved in a study at the University of Southern Florida from 2016 to about 2018, where firefighters have a high incidence of back pain disability because it's a it's a bigger, it's a, a difficult job. And so what the university was doing was they actually were putting trainers in the firehouse to work one on one. And they showed that if you do these exercises, which were some of them or what you just saw, it helps with the outcome less lost time from work problem is that it's very expensive to put a trainer in every firehouse so the we were this was done out of tampa and we basically came into the project and provide the digital solution where we had three groups a control group that did nothing this another group that did the supervised and then a group that we built a self-directed exercise platform that they basically accessed on their smartphone which was modeled off of the same product which patients use on web exercises. And so that ran for two years. When we got the results in, we found that the web-based group that used our solution demonstrated nearly five times less lost work time than the control group and the supervised. So we showed that patients can be helped digitally with this high risk demographic, which we show all the time that patients can be helped, I think, with, with web exercises. We have over 30,000 exercise programs going out a month to patients to help support the in, in office care. And so this helped validate what we do from the healthcare provider providing exercise, which you saw, and then all the way to the, the end user. And so what are some tips for success? And I know we're uh, creeping up um, on, on time allotted. So let me kind of finish up with success, okay? What's the why? Okay, well, the why is I should be doing or think about some exercise, whether I'm a sports chiropractor or whether I'm a wellness or anywhere in between, because it's not just for rehab, it's for wellness, for all sorts of different conditions. And, right, if you treat patients that breathe, it's going to help them as well, right? So let's talk about how to implement some things, some tips. Health literacy is this whole field of study. And what they showed was that patients only remember about 16 to 20% of what doctors tell them in the office. So everything you're saying in the office, about 80% of it isn't, isn't remembered. So think about that. They found that patients remember the most in the beginning and then the end of the visit. So what, what can you do to help that, right? Because we want to make sure patients are educated about their health, why they're coming in, because we get happy patients because patients that understand their care tend to do better, right? So when we talk about behavior change, we have to understand that, okay, if somebody hasn't been stretching, hasn't been doing that, we're going to need to try and implement some strategies because behavior change takes anywhere from 18 days to 264 days to change. So, so what are we, what are we going to do to help that patient along? Well, when they're in your office, whatever they're doing, whether it's you or the CA, so whether it is that head retraction, if you're telling them, okay, Mrs. Jones, I want you to squeeze your shoulder blades and pull the head back, if 
by you simply palpating them at the time they exercise, putting your hands on them, their retention goes up. So that is going to help them remember at home by simply you putting their hands on the patient, which I know everybody does as a chiropractor. We already do this. So that's something which is going to make a big difference right there. And they showed that in this, this study. Tell them, show them, and help them do it. Make them part of the process. So what the heck does that mean? So if there's maybe those big four for the low back, right? Let's talk about the cat, camel, bird, dog, side plank, and curl up. If you show them those four exercises, ask them, I want you to do two of these at home. It's really important for you to continue to do some of these at home in between visits to help support your chiropractic adjustment. They'll say, you know what? I really like the cat, camel, and the bird, dog. Great. Those are the two I want you to focus on. So there's their homework. So making them part of the process brings them into the equation where it puts some of the responsibility on them because patient care, the way I look at it, is a shared responsibility. It's you doing your job and them doing their job to get the best outcome. So making them part of the process helps cultivate that shared responsibility. Don't overload them. Give them one or two things. If somebody's exercising all the time, Maybe give them a few more, but really less is more when it comes down to, to some exercise. And then give them a cue. So what, this was a great book about, about habit change. And so what it boils down to is trying to change a habit is giving them a cue. If I want to start running, they use this example. Well, put your running shoes by the door or by your bed every morning. That's going to be the cue. Put it on. Get out the door. The reward is that feeling better, right? The runner's high or the, 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 what you, the mood that it creates after. So one of the things we do with web exercises is through the mobile patient app is, you know, the, the cue is that exercise program that they need to go to and give you actual feedback every, every day. So whatever that is, whether they're sitting at the desk, think of you know, a reminder, something they can do to cue them to start changing that habit on a regular basis. And to help patients remember, right, because they only remember about 20% of what we tell them, if we give them something digitally, we know that photos home exor- with home exercise, descriptions, and video is actually going to raise their retention to pretty much 80%. So it goes from 20% up to 80% if we give them something that they can follow along with. So with, home, with uh, web exercises creating the program, sharing it, and then giving it something to track so you actually help them be more compliant. Because we we know that we deliver a lot of exercise programs. Our delivery is like, you know, out of 30,000 plus a month, over 80% of those are opened up. And talking about that cue, that's what I'm, what I'm talking about. and trying to make them successful because at, at once they open it up, 50% of those are actually putting in some feedback and helping the doc understand what they're doing at home because it's important that you as a doctor and me as I was practicing, you know, I want the patients doing the right thing at home, at work, because that's going to help them get better. That's going to help them stay, stay healthy. And so what we've done for Cairo Health is for the docs that are currently using web exercises, we built some protocols for cervical and low back based on what we just talked about in the past 45 minutes. So some get started easy ones in that if you're new to web exercises, we can load these protocols and it is really a 30 second process at most to get somebody a specific program for their neck or low back that they can access on their computer or any mobile device then they can actually put in sets, reps, feedback, did have pain, no pain. So you or your staff can engage with them if they did have pain or actually encourage them more and give them encouragement as they come back into your office. We made it real easy getting going on some protocols. And then this is where we'll have to update this. So docs that are new to this, we have the exercise prescription platform that you can get started. It's $50 off an annual membership. The code is actually Cairo Health 50. That's why I updated this and we'll send this out. I'll have Christy re update this. It's Cairo Health um, 50 for $50 off. If you're already a customer, contact us and we'll figure out something um, as well for you. And we also have a completely compliant online learning platform. 
If you sign up, go ahead and we'll give you a free course to get started. There's a couple that are really great in, hey, how do I get started with exercise? And so we have over 100 courses on our academy. And if you sign up, we'll get you the right code. Um, that is, um, I apologize, we'll get an updated code and we'll get you a free course that will help kickstart this to get, get going on this. And then here's my contact info. Please reach out with any questions. Um, be happy to answer for you. Um, like I said, this is my why going back on the first slides. I think we can do better than 30% of chiropractors prescribing exercise as part of the uh, chiropractic treatment plan. So, uh, Christy, I would think us two minutes over. So I want to, if there's any uh, questions, be happy to answer that offline or um, yeah, anything else I can do, please let me know. Thank you so much, Dr. Cruz. I did put the correct code in the chat box. If you have a question for Dr. Cruz, you can pop it in the chat box now. You can also email him at dcruz at webexercises.com. If you're one of the many people who are not watching this live, but you're watching the recording after the fact. Um, while I wait to see if anybody has any questions, just a reminder that next week we will have Dr. Bill Owens here talking about fellowship programs. And the following week, we will have the 10 most impactful skills for chiropractors in 2022 with Dr. Brandon Steele. So make sure that you go to our website at coverhealthusa.com forward slash webinars. Make sure you register for this upcoming webinars. And that's going to take us through the end of August. And it'll be fun to see in the next week or two what's popping up in September. I don't see any questions, Dr. Cruz. So if you're just like me and you think of this email, or you think of your question 30 minutes after a webinar, I never think about them when they're live. Feel free to email me or Dr. Cruz. And if you email me, I will make sure we get that to Dr. Cruz so we can get an answer for you. I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day and a fabulous week. And we'll see you next week. Bye, y'all.